Uh, most of you uh, will be aware that uh, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, which is a, an industrial city uh, in the mid-Atlantic part of the states. And it was a fascinating city because it was also the heavy industries. Uh, it uh, had great steel mills there, automobile industry. But I think the one part of the industry sort of kind of fascinated me, and I don't exactly know why, maybe because of the different structures involved was uh, oil refineries. Uh, Cleveland was a big refiner of oil. Uh, they had a number of oil refineries actually in, in Cleveland, just areas outside of that. And uh, I used to drive past it every and I just would be fascinated with all the pipes and the buildings that were towering above. And um, also they had the flame that we burned off what I later found was methane gas. And it was interesting. I, I knew what a refinery did. It had something to do with producing, you know, petroleum products. I, I knew what the refineries did, but I found out that I really didn't understand, really know much about the refining process. And if you look at the meaning of to refine, it's to free something such as a metal, sugar, oil from impurities or unwanted material. Uh, also, it's the movement is to improve or perfect by pruning and polishing. And so what the refining process does, it, it takes some crude raw material and it takes it to a process of number one, removing all the impurities from it. Uh, and also to again, change it into other products that may be a, a more valuable or a more use. And if we look at um, uh, like crude oil, uh, if you look at crude oil, that's the, the raw product that the, the whole oil refinery process starts with. And you take crude oil and it goes through all the sort of processes, chemical reaction, it uses heat, extreme heat. And what it does, it starts off with crude oil and because of the nature of crude oil with the different sort of its molecular structures, able to get all these other products of the refining process. Uh, you get things such as gasoline from crude oil, you get kerosene from crude oil, you get uh, a lot of uh, chemicals that are based for plastics. Uh, a lot of household products that we're familiar with actually has its basis from crude oil. Uh, jet fuel and other sort of different oil fuel products come from crude oil. So you can see something that in its raw form doesn't have a lot of direct use, but when it goes to the refining process and all the impurities are done, then it's able, its use is able to be extended, so to speak. And the same thing happens to um, uh, precious metals. You, you take precious metals like gold or iron, which is in a very raw uh, ore form. And what they do is they take that ore, that uh, raw metal, and they subject it to extreme heat. I mean, they heat it up to such a place where it actually melts to become molten. And what happens in the process is that the, the impurities of the dross sort of float to the top. And then they're able to scrape that or remove that so that what's left is like the pure element. That's, that's basically how we get pure gold because you take gold in its natural state, it looks like it's just a lump of rock, really. But then it goes through this fine and refining process to make it valuable. And it's interesting because in scripture, God used that same sort of idea of thought about refining and, and basically what it does. So if you can, let's turn to uh, Psalm, uh, let's go to Psalm 66, please. And we'll go down to verse number eight, Psalm 6, 6, verse number eight. 
It says, Oh, bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth thy soul in life, and suffer not our feet to be removed. For thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou brought us into the net, thou latest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast brought men to ride over our hearts, our heads. We went through fire and went through water, but throughout us unto a wealthy place. So that word there where it says thou hast proved and tried us, uh, that relates to the same word as refined. And if we go over to um, Isaiah, please. I'm, I'm sorry, Zechariah. We go to Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. And we'll pick it up with verse 8 now. If you were to read the whole chapter, uh, Zechariah 13, it talked about what the Lord saw Israel in that particular state. And it, it told them the different things they had done and what was going to be the consequence of that. But I think what's more important in verse number eight, it says, And it shall come to pass that in all the lands that the Lord, two parts in shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left there then. So the Lord saying that. With all the things that Israel going, part of it is just going to be cut off. Part of it is just going to be set aside as waste. And in verse number nine, it says, I will bring the third part to the fire and refine them as silver is refined. And will try them as gold is tried. And they shall call in my name and I will hear them. And I say, it is my people. And they shall say that God is my God. So even though Israel had gotten himself into such a state uh, even though Israel had gotten them into a state of, they're basically rubble. They're basically in a state, they're in pure state. And even though God had chosen them to be his special people, even though God is set to do so much and made so many promises of them and that he saw them as value. But for some reason, Israel continued to put themselves in a position of being rubble. You know, as much as God tried to do something with them, they just wouldn't let him do it. And, you know, he, he told them that if they obeyed, there would be good consequences. If they didn't obey, there would be bad consequences. But as they went on, Israel, for some reason, they just not could not do it. But the Lord said that, okay, at one point, you're going to be going through a lot of afflictions. You're going to go through trials and tribulations. But the Lord said that what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to look upon that. I'm going to be able to... To, to return that. Um, and so the Lord's able to use the trials and tribulations uh, that they're going through. He was still able to let Israel know that he wasn't finished with them, that there was still a plan. There was still uh, a plan of being able to bring him back to something that he could be useful and that it would be joy to him. I mean, Again, in verse number nine, we'll read it again. It says, I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. Basically, I, I'm going to take them through that process of going again and purifying them. I'm going to take them through the process of removing the impurities from them. And I'm going to take them through the process of, of, again, making them something valuable. And in those days, silver and gold are probably to do the most valuable and precious metal. So that's why God says, I'm going to refine your silver and refine. I'm, I'm going to take you to the trials and tribulations part of that, that, that fire process. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that as silver, natural, the, the raw silver is taking the process to remove the impurities and dross. I'm going to do the same with you. And the end result is that they shall call on my name and I will hear them. All of a sudden now God can see Israel as being of value. God can see Israel as something that he can do something with. God is Israel something now I, I could use. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. And again, it's like precious metal that until something is done with that raw form, 
and the process is moved in, then it can be shaped and molded into something that's used. And, you know, most of us know that silver and gold is molded into all forms of jewelry or other sort of ornamental pieces, but usually those pieces are seen as valuable among, among other things. And so that's what God has always had in his mind for Israel. He always wanted them to be looked upon and regarded as something valuable, as something better than anything else around that they were, he wanted them to be the top people. He didn't want just to be the ordinary people. He wanted them to be the top people of all people. And so I guess that's a promise that God always made to his people that he, he wanted to do that. And so I guess everything that Israel went through uh, is all part of that uh, refining process that you know, God to continue to show that they were valuable and of use to him. And it's interesting because a lot of times people think that because God chose natural things in the Old Testament to express, I guess, a lot of his spiritual truth and what they expect because that's all he had at that time. Uh, people weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. He couldn't really talk to them in the spiritual way that he wanted to. So he had to try to teach them deep spiritual lessons through natural means. And it's amazing because one of the things we come to find out that when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, that even though the Lord doesn't necessarily use direct natural things in those days like today, we still understand his intent. We, we understand not so much, we're not bound by so much the letter, but by the intent. We understand what God's intent was. We understand what God's meaning was. We understand what what God wanted to do with his people. And the beauty of all that is, is that, you know, when we're adopted as God's people by the influence of the Holy Spirit, those principles of refining apply to us, you know. And, and you, you look at the word that they use for, in the Greek word for trying, it also means trying, proven, or saying. And if you look at the, vet, the definition of the word of saying, it means to analyze something as such as or for one or more specific pro properties or proponents, or it also means to judge the worth of something to estimate this value. So that whole process of trying, refining, proving the same, it definitely applies to us now. It's sometimes people think that what God did with Israel in the Old Testament, it's okay to read about, but they think that because we're under the New Testament, that we're in a completely different set of rules and regulations, but not so. It's we're just living it from ourselves because the things that God wants us to know, it's written deep in our heart. And so the whole principle of um, the whole principle of proving and trying is very scriptural and it's deep in scripture. Let's go to uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. Let's, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll go to verse number 9. It says, for we, meaning us, we're spirit-filled, for we are laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry, you're God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builder thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he had built therein, he shall receive a reward. And it goes on, it says, any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. And so what the Lord's saying that you know, when we come to the Lord, we start to, to build our life in the Lord, that we're going to be tried, we're going to be proved, we're going to be tested, we're going to be a savior, 
we're going to have to constantly, God is going to constantly assess us. He's going to constantly try us. He's going to constantly approve and assay us. He wants us to always be of value to him. And so there's going to be things that we're going to come against us that's going to be like those proving times, those, those, that trying time to where we have an opportunity to show God our value. Uh, we have an opportunity to show God that what we're building is built on a solid foundation. And we're trying to build something of substance. We're trying to, to build something of value. We, we, we don't want to really build a work of rubble. Because, you know, think about if you take something of work in rubble, uh, if you apply fire to it, it's going to burn. It's going to burn very easy. It's going to be destroyed. But if you take something like a very hard, precious metal, like gold and silver, that when the heat is applied, it won't necessarily burn it up. But at the same time, it, if there's any impurities, the first thing is those impurities are going to be uh, taken away and the imperfection is going to be gone. So I think that's what God wants to make sure that we're doing. God wants to know that whatever we're doing is out to show what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, which is part of uh, what we're commanded to do in uh, Romans chapter 12. But the beginning says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing your mind to show what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. So right at the beginning, our calling is to make sure that we're always doing things that can stand up to God's scrutiny, so to speak. We always want to make sure that we're doing things to, to make sure that we're doing things of, of glory to God. And that should be in all aspects of our life, you know, whether not just when we're before each other in fellowship, but when we're out away from fellowship, that's what is even more important, that we make sure that what we're building, the life that we're constructing is something that will be proven to show glory to God, is something that when it's tested, that it will come out to be able to, to show the glory to God. And I mean, we, we hear that in testimonies all the time about our manner, how we, we work and how we live. And, you know, our brother Matt gave a testimony about the work situation. I mean, that was, that was his being tried there. I mean, he could have quite thought, well, wow, I want a job. I don't have a job. Uh, this is the only thing that's come up right now. So, you know, if I have to not go to meetings, it's not a big deal. I'll make it up. But no, he made a stand. He made a stand to show that what was valuable to him. He made a stand to show what, what was going to be precious before God. And the, the outside of it, that God honored that and he blessed it so that he could continue to be able to be that testimony, so he can continue to, to be valuable. And now I'm sure that what's going to happen because of that, you know, Matt's going to be put in a situation where just the testimony, being able to share to people, just being able to be put in situations to where he can talk to people, they can share the gospel because of that standing tape, because of the time when he was tried and proven that he found himself that what he was building was of value and that God could do with that. And that's something that we, each and every one of us has to think about and remember as we go about our walk, you know, what are we building? Are we building something that's going to be glory to God? Are we building something that is just going to fall apart and burn up? whenever trials and tribulations are in. And that's what we don't want. I mean, you know, some of us are just going through all sorts of things. Uh, you know, our sister Nikki, she was talking about the testimony they had with the housing situation when they're out of work and how that lasted for over a year. But she recognized at the end of that, that God was able to bring forth something great that was able to keep her, to strengthen her through all that process that at the end of it, something happened that could bring glory to God. Something happened to where they can make that stand before God and be useful before God. And I guess that's the thing that we, we have to understand that, you know, we don't, we don't like to go through trials and tribulations. We, we don't like to, to have to deal with these uncertain things. But at the same time, uh, those are things that we know can be used by the Lord. Uh, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, please. Yep, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we'll go right to um, 
verse number one, and this is Apostle Paul uh, writing to the Thessalonians. And I've always really liked reading Thessalonians, particularly First Thessalonians, the first couple of chapters, because it really shows how much Paul really cared for these people. I mean, they weren't, the only connection Paul had with them is that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. But yet you can see how he loved them, how he cared about them, his whole regard to them. And, and, to re, and even remind him how he came before them. If you go to uh, chapter 2, verse number 1, it says, For yourselves, brethren, you know, I interest in unto you that it was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and was shamefully treated, as you know, at Philippi, we're bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God without much content with much contention. For our exaltation was not of deceit, nor uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God would try the hearts. For neither at any time use me flattering words as you know, nor a cloak of covenants, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, even we might have been burdensome as the apostle of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse church of children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we're willing to have imparted to you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you are dear unto us. And that, I guess that really does speak to us as our, our living testimony that when we're out there before people, we want to make sure that what we're doing is doing things that truly going to bring glory to God. We want to make sure that what we're doing, we're not doing something just out of our own desires. We're not doing something out of our own ideas, our own thoughts. And unfortunately, there's so many people out there who consider themselves to be Christians who are saying all sorts of things, but yet none of it is to bring glory to God, really. None of it is to show themselves a value. And, and if you try them in their hearts, a lot of times there's a lot of deceit involved. I mean, you look at all these guys with these great ministries where they're bringing in lots of money, they're bringing lots of people, and you know, they're saying all the right words, they're saying the right God words, they're saying amen, hallelujah, but yet their hearts are full of deceit, you know, and if when God looks at the heart and he tries, the heart, there's no value of there. there's nothing there, and, and they're all living false, I mean, I guess they, they, live, they have fool's gold, okay, they think that what they have is really precious, but it's fool's gold, it's of no value at all, and the thing of it is, there's going to come a time that they're going to find out that all they put their effort into, everything they did was full glow. It had no value whatsoever. That when it's actually have to go before God to be looked at, then they're going to find out it, it, it's of no value. Uh, I know I, I read stories that back in the um, prospecting days in the early 1800s, when people would find gold, that they would take it to a, a sayer's office. And the first thing he'd do, he would test it the seed was pure gold. And I think, I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's some acid or something that dropped on it to show what it was. And you know, you had some crafty people who had these ore that they try to make it seem like it was real gold, but when it goes before the sayer's office and they go through that proving process, right off the bat it was showing up, you don't, what you have is fake, it's not good at all. And so that's what's gonna happen to anybody who, who goes to want to say these things supposedly in the name of God, and when they're proved and tested, they're going to find out is of no value whatsoever. And what the Paul was saying that we come to you knowing that what we say is going to have to be proven and tested by God. God's going to try our hearts, He's going to look at the heart, He's going to prove and test it to make sure that what we're saying is according to His word. And that's the same thing we want to make sure that whenever we're out there talking to people, whenever we're, we're talking about the Lord and preaching the gospel to them, we want to make sure that what we're doing is something that can stand up under God's scrutiny. That what we can do, the, the bottom line is to make sure that we're doing what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Because if we're not, it's not going to come to any nod. I mean, it's, somebody may hear that and they may decide to do something good about it, but the person is saying things with you see in their heart, they're not going to get the good. And some of them just will go on and hope that everything's fine. And at the end of the day, when the great pruning the great trying process has to happen. Like I said, they're going to find out they have rubble is going to all be burned up. And none, none of us wants to be in that situation, even though we can see ourselves going through trials and tribulations. 
uh, we don't ever want to be caught in that situation because it it's a blessing. I mean, we know that we're going to go through trials and tribulations. We know that there's going to be trials and tribulations that we're going to go, go through. But I guess the blessing is we know that all that can be used for our benefit to strengthen us and to continue to make us valuable. I mean, right now that you know, we've got a lot of sickness going on, a lot of affliction, and it's, it's very easy to think, well, what good is going to come out of this? You know, what, what's the value? But I think the value and the good that comes out of when we just remain stand fast and unmovable before the Lord, that we just maintain our consistency, we maintain our focus, we maintain knowing that, well, Lord, I'm going to keep praying about this. Lord, I'm going to keep looking. I'm going to keep knowing that at some point you're able to use, at some point you're able to, to bring glory to this. And even sometimes we get the victories over things and we're able to share that to one another to where we're able to encourage one another. It says iron and sharpen as iron. We're able to build each other up because of us. So like I said, nobody enjoys being afflicted. Nobody enjoys trials and tribulations. But we have to understand and we have to acknowledge that these are things that God can use for our betterment. These are things that God can use to keep us in that, that gold state, to keep us in that valuable state. And more importantly, you think of God being able to take us as a, a, a rude, raw material, but he's able to make us into so much more. I mean, a lot of us know in our testimony, the things that we've done for the Lord were things we probably think we could never even have thought about doing moving around places, witnessing the people, doing all sorts of manner of things that none of us, before we came to Lord in that, that raw state, could ever imagine us being able to accomplish and do some of the things that we've done before. And so I guess that's something we have to look up with. Uh, let's just finish up in 1 Peter chapter 1, please. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll go right to verse number 3. And like I said, this is our last scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So right there, it, it's a recount of what God has to offer us. It's a recount of, of what we are and what we should see as something valuable from God. So, you know, it, it, when you think about that, there's so much that's been given to us. There's so much God is prepared to do for us. But he goes on, he says, verse number six, he says, wherein you greatly rejoice. We should rejoice in that. He says, Though now for season it need be, your heaviness through manifold temptation. So he says, you know, yes, you're going you're gonna to rejoice, even though it may only seem for a season because you're going through heaviness, trans, you know, temptations. And sometimes we can go through things that it can temporarily rob us for, of our joy. We can be so laying down, we can be so caught up in trials and tribulations. We can be so seeming overwhelmed that at a, a particular moment, only for a season, it may rob us of our joy to sometimes we even think, well, Lord, you know, am I really unworthy to you? Am I really valuable to you? But if we just keep pressing in, we know what's going to happen because if we go to verse number seven, it says that the trial of your faith be much more precious than a gold that perishes, will be tried with fire. And that's interesting because gold will eventually perish. But our faith won't, our standing alone won't perish as, we, as long as we are allowed to be going through the trials and tribulations. It says our faith is more precious than gold. We're, we're more valuable to God in, than any other thing. It says, again, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold, that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be founded to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So if we just... All we got to do is hang in there, just continue looking to the Lord. So at the end of the day, the Lord's going to completely recognize who we are, what we have in our value. It goes to verse number eight, it says, Whom have you not seen your love? And whom, though now you see him not, ye believe and ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So even though we don't see Christ before us right now, even though we don't 
to the Lord. We have the Holy Spirit, so we do have that connection. We, we do know that the promises God make are yea and amen. And that if we continue to go through there, we allow ourselves to be going through the trials and tribulations, allow ourselves to be tried, allow ourselves to be proved, allow ourselves to be refined, that we're going to continue to be what God wants us to be. And the ultimate of that is going to receive the salvation of our soul. I know other people said. All right, we'll leave it there. Uh, 